Hey, let me ask y'all a question. Wait, hang on just a second. Is there a reason why he, if he were to kick in my door, that he's not getting arrested for that? Like literally kick in my door? Okay. Did he actually kick in yes. the door? The yes. door came open without you pulling it. Oh no. On it? He, I mean, if it were unlocked, he would have kicked in. He kicked it in. Yes, ma'am. But it, it was. Is there a reason why? So you can go up to somebody's house and kick in their door? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Listen. Okay. Hear me out, okay? I mean, y'all obviously had to hold him back when y'all got up here. I wasn't up here when it first happened. Somebody was. There was plenty of officers yes. that had yes. to hold him back. Yes, ma'am, but not me personally. Okay. I can't speak for well, that. Well, is there a reason okay. why he's not going to jail? Because he tried to kick in my door? Okay. I wasn't here when he tried to kick in the door. Okay. And when he, when y'all were up here, uh, what the officer said is that it wasn't, didn't look like he was lunging for you, but rather the door. Okay. So you can just walk up to somebody's house and try to kick in their door and that's fine? No, ma'am. Okay. That's why we're doing reports. So are we doing this because he's a lieutenant of the Glen County Police Department? No, ma'am. Picture, if you will, a society delicately balanced on the edge of order and chaos. At its forefront stand the police officers, not merely as guardians, but as embodiments of the community's trust, a trust as shiny and tangible as the badges they wear. But when an officer's actions result in the loss of human life, the aftermath weighs like an anchor. Scrutinized by the public's eye, they find themselves struggling with internal and external pressures. It is in this vortex, where the mind battles with profound psychological and emotional consequences, that some officers are pushed to the brink, teetering between duty and despair. In this video, we delve into such a tale. Journey with us into the shadows of conscience and consequence. Let's dive in. On June 18, 2010 in rural Georgia, Caroline Small, a 35-year-old mother of two, led the police on an erratic, low-speed chase. The police observed her driving recklessly, and she refused to obey commands to pull over. The unarmed Caroline ran over spike strips and was driving on bare rims. After a successfully executed pit maneuver, Caroline's Buick Century spun out into a residential area. Two officers, who had boxed Caroline in with their cruisers, hopped out of their vehicles and began shouting orders. Two officers unloaded a total of eight bullets into Caroline's car, striking her about the head and face. Despite her severe injuries and one deputy noting she was still breathing, officers failed to render any aid. Instead, according to retired GBI agent Mike McDaniel, who later delved into the officer's conduct, the officers made comments comparing their marksmanship. 
Police records further reveal that when an EMT arrived eager to offer medical assistance, one of the officers dismissively waved him away. Caroline Small was pronounced dead at a Savannah hospital 10 days later. This heartbreak came just days after another significant life event. Her divorce was finalized. Caroline was described as a loving mother of two who had struggled for years with mental health and substance abuse issues. She had been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and dissociative disorder and was in the midst of a drug relapse. Within hours of the shooting, the Glenn County Police Chief told local reporters that based on his preliminary review, he believed the officers feared for their lives and acted appropriately. Since it was an officer-involved shooting, the incident was referred to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. The shooting gained national media attention and both officers' files were frequently subjected to public records requests. Ultimately, however, a grand jury determined the officers feared for their lives and the public's safety. They decided not to indict the officers, and a federal judge subsequently threw out the Small family's wrongful death lawsuit. County personnel records reveal that Officer Robert Corey Sasser, who fired most of the shots, had a prior officer-involved shooting in which he was cleared of wrongdoing. While he escaped official charges in the Caroline Small case, time would reveal that he endured another, possibly harsher, form of punishment. Robert Corey Sasser, better known as Corey, was a 41-year-old from Brunswick, Georgia, who had an extensive military and law enforcement background. A veteran of the U.S. Army, Corey honed his skills as a reconnaissance specialist and scout sniper. Following his military service, he obtained a master's in criminal justice. His credentials also boasted several certificates from the Office of Homeland Security and Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Most recently, Corey was employed as a lieutenant with the Glynn County Police Department since 2001. At a Halloween party in 2007, then 30-year-old Corey met and instantly fell in love with 24-year-old Katie Kettles. Born in Dublin, Georgia, Katie earned a bachelor's degree in education and taught Sunday school at church. She volunteered with hurricane relief efforts and loved to ride horses in her spare time. According to Katie's mother, she loved Corey and wanted a life with him. After a period of dating, they had their first child, a son. Yet by 2010, they found themselves sleeping in separate bedrooms. The 2010 shooting of Caroline Small marked a turning point for Corey, drawing him and his family into a storm of personal and professional hardships. Observing a marked change in Corey's demeanor after the incident, Katie pointed to heightened anger and mood swings. She attributed their growing detachment to Corey's lingering remorse and unaddressed anger stemming from the Small shooting. Adding to this complexity, Corey anonymously sent holiday and birthday money to Small's two children annually. Katie, concerned, confided to the police, I told him you can't do this. I've told him that he had to stay away and he was having a hard time with it. Eight years after the small shooting, Katie moved out of the marital home, leaving Corey grappling with increasing desolation. His emotions only intensified, turning to jealousy when he discovered she had begun a new relationship. On May 13, 2018, Corey appeared unannounced at his estranged wife's house in the early morning hours. He started looking around the house and peeping through the windows, and that's when he saw Katie kissing John Hall. Enraged, he allegedly tried to kick down her door. Katie called 911 and stated Corey had threatened to kill her and she feared for her life. Multiple deputies responded to Katie's home, each subordinate to Corey within the police department. Why are you here? Yes. You are not allowed in my house. Uh, he is not allowed in my house. This is not his house. Come over here. Come this over is here. not you your house. You know what's going to happen. This is not your house. Let go. Let go. I'm good. I'm this good. This is what I'm happens when you try to kick the door. I had a conversation. Hey. 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 Let him go. Let him go. Let him go. Let him go. Lieutenant, what Okay. Stop. No. Lieutenant, give him keys. Give him keys. Okay. That's why we call the police. Give keys to his Tahoe. Grab him. I live here by myself. Oh, we? Are you kidding me? You're just at my house today. It doesn't matter. I live here by myself. Today. Yes. LT. What's going on? Can you tell us what's happening? Yeah, we're married. Okay. She's over here with another man. She lives here. Yes. Oh, but we're married. We're legally married. I got you. I want the keys to my Tahoe. But 
this is three months. Yeah. We've been separated for three months. Yeah. Somebody's over here. He's having a little bit of an issue with it. Right. Yeah. And the thing is, he's flipping out. I mean, he was literally about to kick the door in, which I know he's Ricky y'all's Ferrell's lieutenant or whoever. I mean, she was here just a few minutes ago. With we were all here. Yeah. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. But it's, you know, know whatever. Guy. If he wants the keys to it, he can take it. That's what he. That's what he's. If that's what he wants, it's he can a, have yeah, it. Yeah. I'm not seeing any marks on the door. Oh no, he yeah. was kicking the door. Right. Yeah. Kicking I'm gonna I'm gonna check it out in just a second. As long as he just leaves, is is. I'm good. Okay. Did he? he did he, he? Yes, he about kicked the front door. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Did he say anything to you, partner? Here you go. No, I, he, you go. I mean, he, uh, on other, he was gonna kill everybody in here. Yeah. That, that I have no idea when did he say that guy is. Yes, he, he said did. that tonight. Yes, he did. So, he did. You know, he threatened. Really he's upset. Just get yeah. him off my phone. I mean, Please. Guys, come on. Okay. Well, at what point did he make any threat? He did. Yeah. While he was banging on the door. What did he say? He was kicking on the door. He's like, I'll f kill you. I'll f kill him. I'll f kill you. But, yes, he did say that. Just. I'm not trying to charge. I don't, I don't. I just want him to go away. Okay. Okay. I just want him to go away. Thank you. You okay? I'm upset. If I, you know what I mean. Oh, I, I, I believe it. I don't uh, personally know what you're going through, but yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I get it, man. Hey. hey, let me ask y'all a question. Well, hey, is there a reason why he, if he were to kick in my door, that he's not getting arrested for that? Like literally kick in my door? Okay. Did he actually kick in yes. the door? The yes. door came open without you pulling it. Oh no, on? he. I mean, if it were unlocked, he would have kicked in. It kicked it in. Yes, ma'am. But it, it was. Is there a reason why? So you can go up to somebody's house and kick in their door? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Listen. Okay. Hear me out, okay? I mean, y'all obviously had to hold him back. When y'all got up here. I wasn't up here when it first happened. Somebody was. There was plenty of officers yes. that had yes. to hold him back. Yes, ma'am, but not me personally. Okay. I can't speak for well, that. Well, is there a reason okay. why he's not going to jail? Because he tried to kick in my door? Okay. I wasn't here when he tried to kick in the door. Okay. And when he, when y'all were up here, uh, what the officer said is that it wasn't, didn't look like he was lunging for you, but rather the door. Okay. So you can just walk up to somebody's house and try to kick in their door and that's fine? No, ma'am. Okay. That's why we're doing a report. So are we doing this because he's a lieutenant of the Glen County Police Department? No, ma'am. Uh, it's because I'm looking at the door and I don't see any significant marks, just like any other case. If I don't have an unbiased witness that can cooperate your story, okay. I just have to do an incident report, and that's okay. what we're doing. Miss Katie, if something else happens, if he comes back, if anybody no, comes back, No, it's all right, because I'm leaving. Us. I'm scared to stay here, okay? okay? I'm leaving. Okay. Katie was stunned when Corey wasn't immediately arrested after the incident. Distraught, she told her mother, the Glen County Police Department won't act until someone's taken out in a body bag. However, a shift occurred after the police reviewed the body camera footage, leading to Corey's arrest. He faced charges of simple battery, criminal trespass, and felony obstruction. Upon posting a $4,000 bond, Corey faced another blow. The police department placed him on unpaid leave and initiated an internal investigation. This development deeply affected Corey. For him, Policing wasn't just a job, it defined him. Compounding his challenges, he was grappling with PTSD amidst a tumultuous divorce. Four days after the unsettling episode at Katie's residence, Corey was served with divorce papers. Hours later, officers received a 911 call about a barricaded shooter and a single gunshot in a forested area off Highway 99. Based on reports that Corey might be involved, over 100 officers from the Glynn County Police, Glynn County Sheriff's Office, and Georgia State Patrol, supported by helicopters and armored cars, responded to the scene. This massive turnout was to address what turned out to be a standoff between Corey and the authorities. After a tense period of negotiations, Corey, clearly in distress, stepped out of his truck. Moments later, a SWAT team member acted, tasing Corey, who was subdued and arrested. A search of his vehicle revealed both a gun and a note. While being examined by medical personnel for his taser wounds, he kicked two officers in the groin. Following his hospitalization, he posted a $5,000 bond and was granted conditional release. He could only return to Glynn County for court appointments and was mandated to undergo PTSD treatment at a VA hospital. Seeking solace, 
Corey moved to his sister's residence in Alabama. On June 26, 2018, Corey returned to Glynn County to attend divorce proceedings, which he believed did not go well for him. Within a span of merely two months, he faced two arrests, was ousted from his lieutenant position, grappled with an ongoing investigation that threatened his police certification, and was bound by restrictions that limited visits with his 10-year-old son. Battling depression and on Zoloft, all while wading through the rough waters of a bitter divorce, Corey sought a brief respite. He chose Moondoggy's Pizza and Pub for a meal, lingering in Glynn County far longer than legally allowed. Upon entering the restaurant, he observed his estranged wife, Katie, enjoying dinner with John Hall. According to police records, Katie and John complained that Corey confronted the couple, formed his hand into the shape of a gun, and pretended to pull the trigger. At a subsequent press conference, the Glynn County Police Chief acknowledged the department had received a complaint though he avoided providing details. Responding to claims by the media that the department didn't address the threat appropriately, the police chief claimed an investigation was started and added, We collaborated with judicial authorities to determine if there was a basis for arrest. We utilized every legal measure to ensure safety. Police later determined Corey had committed no crime. On the evening of Thursday, June 28th, Katie's mother was made aware there had been a shooting on Talamato Island, where John Hall resides, and dialed the police. I have just heard that someone has been hurt very badly, and we are feared for our lives. Okay, what do you mean someone's been hurt very badly? I have heard that John, this guy named John was killed. And he is my, oh, that Corey Sasser killed him. And uh, he may be on the way here. He has threatened to hurt us before. You said your daughter is at your promenade? Yes. Yes, her name is Katie Settles. It's her ex-husband, Corey Sasser. Jeez. All right, sweetheart, you're doing a good job, okay? Okay. I've turned all the lights off in this home because I don't want him coming by here and seeing where we are. Oh, my God, and I haven't talked to my daughter, Katie. I don't know if she's all Baby, right. just take a deep breath from me, okay? Okay, is anyone at Promenade yet? My daughter, my daughter, my daughter has been with John. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh my God, no, I knew this was going to happen. According to official court documents, shortly after the incident two days earlier at Moondoggies, Corey texted a former colleague about Talamato Island. The following day, June 27th, Corey traded in his white Ford F-150 for a silver Toyota Tacoma pickup truck. He was seen transferring a pair of rifles and a handgun into the new vehicle. The same night, Corey searched public address for John Hall Jr. Darian on his cell phone. He followed that up with a search for husband kills man who wife cheats with. The next day, the 28th, Corey made a foreboding move by contacting a local funeral home to prepay for his cremation and funeral services. Next, he engaged in an unusually extended conversation with his mother and other family members. By nightfall at 9.39 p.m., a Talamato resident dialed 911. She reported hearing gunshots and her brother recounted a chilling scene. A man emerging from John Hall's house, gun in hand, declaring, This is what happens when you sleep with another man's wife. The dispatcher immediately passed the information along to officers. Um, the girl told me immediately she heard six shots. The guy's down in his driveway. They don't think he's breathing. He's not moving. Um, upon them going response... They told me they believe the suspect is Corey Sasser. He's driving a silver Toyota Tacoma. He's wearing a green Under Armour shirt, and that's all that we know. In a harrowing sequence of events, Corey had driven over 30 miles to confront 39-year-old John Hall, shooting and killing him in the driveway of his McIntosh County home. Without hesitation, he then stormed into the residence and fatally shot Katie. As Corey fled the scene, he reached out to the McIntosh County 911 director, who pleaded with him to turn himself in. Corey, honey, listen to me. 
listen to me. You need to turn yourself in. Can you hear me? You need to turn yourself in. You, you and I both know that running is not is not going to do you any good. You know that. So tell me, tell me where you are. Tell me exactly where you are, Corey. You you have you've got to do this, and you know it. Is that where you're at? Eventually, Corey agreed to head to the local jail and surrender. However, this act of contrition never took place, as in the early morning hours of June 29th, Corey's lifeless body was discovered in his truck on his own driveway, having succumbed to a self-inflicted gunshot wound. As we've journeyed into the shadows of conscience and consequence, One glaring truth remains. The delicate balance between order and chaos is continually tested, often at significant cost. Police officers, those very embodiments of the community's trust, grapple with the repercussions of their actions. Yet it is the families of the victims who too often bear the brunt of this struggle. Their quest for justice, in many instances, remains unfulfilled. A poignant reminder that the scales are not always evenly balanced. 